Okay, lesson 29, Pratyahara part 2, short recap. When you practice yoga correctly, it soon leads to increased sensitivity and consciousness. This automatically leads to becoming aware of ourself and our past. And that very often becomes a distraction. There are memories, there are emotions. Therefore, Pratyahara is a fixed part of the whole yoga framework. It is one of the eight limbs of yoga. It's very important limb. It is the fifth limb because it's the right time to start discussing it now after yama niyama, which kind of forces you to evaluate and reevaluate your values, the way you stand in life, the way you behave or act and react. Then comes the practical part, asana, uh, pranayama, meditation. And having gone through all these steps, past halfway in the course, if it is correct and you have practiced fairly regularly, you have noticed increased sensitivity and consciousness. That usually already starts quite in the beginning of the course. Because yoga is very powerful to bring that about, if you do it correctly. The misconception that people have about Pratyahara, though, is that they interpret it as oppression. Oppression memory, like as if denying that it exists. That is not the case. That is simply not truthful. You're violating one of the yamas if you do that. The whole thing about yoga is that whatever it is that you do, you do it consciously. So when confronted with memory, good, bad memories generally are standing out. I mean bad memories, memories that cause uh, pain, emotion. Before you apply Pratyahara, you first sit down and ask yourself, what is this about? What is this memory about? What happened at that time? And why did it happen? The law of cause and effect comes into play. And that is important to at least understand. Because understanding what happened in the past helps you to understand who you are in the present and it helps you to understand where you need to go in the future. It's all linked. So not oppression of whatever it is that we remember, feel, but First observation, what is this? What is it about? What caused it? And what is my role in all this, active or passive? You try to put the pieces of the puzzle together. That is an important part of your development as a result of yoga practice. But there comes a point if you're not careful that you drown in the memory, that you drown in the misery. And then it is important that you say, okay, enough of this. Let me detach from the issue, the memory, the pain. The, 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 it, it can be a good memory too, as you've read in the handout. Nostalgia. Let me take back my attention from, attention is energy, from the thought, the feeling, the memory, and let me redirect it to 
something of my choice. That can be a chore, that can be uh, study, work, but you need to redirect consciously. The importance of this becomes clear when you see how people function who have lived through very traumatic experiences. I think when we discussed Pratyahara the first time, before the, the corona lockdown, I mentioned going on a vacation in the southern France, going into a, a bar coffee shop where the villagers also come to drink their coffee and their wine, and meeting people, old people that lived through the Second World War, whose only conversation is their experience of the Second World War, 40, 50, 60 years later. And every day of your vacation that you spend in that coffee shop, meeting those people, you hear the same story again and again. They never get tired of it, which means they live in the past. Physically, they are here in the present, but their mind is in the past. And the danger of that is that you stop evolving, you stop growing, developing. Those people are paralyzed. This is not a judgment, negative or positive, it's, it's just an observation, it's a fact. And there is a danger that this happens to us. And Pratyahara shows us that no matter how severe, how traumatic the past has been, we can detach from it if we decide to do so. And to do so, you need to approach it in a very, in a conscious way. Do not deny it, do not oppress it, see what's going on, but consciously from now on. See it as an exploration of your past. The moment that emotions become involved, you're not a neutral observer anymore, then you need to step in detach and redirect your energy. In that way, regardless of what had happened in the past and how traumatizing it has been, you free up a lot of energy with which you will go onto a path of growth and development again. Now I said already that this also applies to good memories, reminiscing about the past. A very good example of this is my sisters, my twin sisters. I have two sisters, same age, twin sisters. And they're wonderful, beautiful girls. But they're still girls actually, four years younger than me. In Korean you would say they are ajumas by now, but they're totally not. <laughs> They're still young girls. They, because they were, they were blonde, blue eyes, twins, they got so much attention from the moment they were born. They still meet their uh, uh, elementary uh, first grade uh, school teacher on a fairly regular basis. Um, but the thing is, they, they are still in the past. Again, this is not a judgment just an observation, you will, based on what I'm telling you, you will recognize this either in yourself or in your family or friend circles. Because most people, in fact, do get stuck in the past, whether it's good memory or bad memory. So in case of my sisters, it's good memory. They were always active with sports, they, uh, performed on national TV many times with a, uh, with a dance troupe, uh, modern dance, jazz dance, what have you, show dance. Um, still, they exercise every day, swimming, running, making long walks, which they post on Facebook. Wonderful. But they are part of a group that came into being in high school. And all those people from high school 
They are about my age, two, three years younger maybe, but they're still the same as they were in high school. It's cute and it's nice. You live in a comfortable country, there are not so many challenges, so you have actually the luxury that you can. But when you practice yoga, this is not an option anymore because you start to feel stuck. You become stifled in your dynamic growth process. They compensate for that by going back to the past. They still meet whenever they can, watching soccer together, or go to a concert together, or meet in a bar or a coffee shop together. Sometimes I envy that. Until I realize that I moved on and they haven't. So let's have a look. Last time we talked about Pratyahara in general. So today we will have a look at some concrete steps that you can take systematically. The first step in Pratyahara is Yatamana Pratyahara. Yatamana means progressive, progressive detachment. That especially applies to the past. When I go home, last time I went home is 10 years ago, but when I go home, I invariably take the bicycle from my, the shed of my mom and I ride through the neighborhood. I pass by the school, which has now been torn down. I pass by um, the old house where I lived and then the new house where we were, where we moved. And um, I go around the lake uh, where I grew up. There is emotion there. There's so many memories there. And you would think I would want to go back there. And I've always said, no, please don't. When I go for, a, a, usually it's 10 days, when I go back, it's a long time ago that I did, but when the day approaches that it's time to go back to Korea, I'm relieved to go back. Because it's my way of detaching. There's so many memories in the past, good and bad, If you become a yogi, there is no difference anymore between good and bad. It's both an emotion, good and bad, and it both makes you unstable and distracts you. Can you feel that? So it's nice to go on a trip down to memory lane, um, but only for a moment. Then it's better to go back to the reality of the present. Now we all have situations because we go to school, because we move, because we have a job and then change jobs. If you go back, you, you go back and visit your colleagues, drink a, a coffee with them or tea and have a chat. Um, you go back to your old neighborhood, you go back to your old school, that's normal, that is natural. And in the beginning, you do that frequently. Maybe every week, every month. Now, if you start to notice that you get stuck in a pattern, and as a yogi you will, you will start experiencing resistance, it is time that you start applying the first step in Pratyahara, gradual detachment. So if you take the example of my sisters, that is 40 years later, they're still in the same pattern of going back to the past. It doesn't diminish, it doesn't become less. Just repeating. It's basically their whole life and that of their whole uh, community of high school friends. 
When you notice that you are in such a situation, and it is bothering you, of course, if you enjoy it, like my sisters, just continue life like that. As a yogi, it's very likely that you cannot be satisfied with such a pattern. Then you start to consciously change the pattern. If it is every week that you go back to your neighborhood or your school or your whatever it is that you go back to, you deliberately change it from one week to one month. You increase the period in between. And then you extend it to three months, once every three months, and then maybe once a year. You will see if you approach things in that way, it will naturally wear off. Because you, by changing the pattern in a very natural, non-violent way, you increase the distance between yourself and that emotion, that memory. You detach yourself, literally. If that doesn't work, we have Vyatireka Pratyahara. Vyatireka Pratyahara is exclusive detachment. Exclusive detachment, the best example that I can give you is when you are dealing with an addiction. There are many addictions. Usually when we talk about addictions, we, we think about alcohol, drugs, but relationships often are addictive. Um, watching TV can be addictive. Uh, there are many things in life that can be uh, habitual and when not available, it makes us restless and disturbed. So, being an addiction. Exclusive Pratyahara, Vyatireka Pratyahara, means that you are going to focus only on that particular aspect that you are dealing with. And before I learned about Pratyahara, but after I started my yoga practice, I applied this technique in a very natural way. Because when I discovered yoga, I was a smoker. And from the moment that I started practicing yoga, I became naturally aware of the fact that, that smoking is bad and it would be nice to quit. Only to come to the conclusion that quitting is actually easier said than done as many smokers will recognize. So what I did is exactly this. I started focusing on all the aspects of smoking. Every bit of information that I could find about smoking, I gathered and I wrote down all the negative aspects of smoking on an A4 sized piece of paper and I stuck it to the wall above my desk. And I ended up with almost 40 pieces of A1 size paper, each with one negative aspect of smoking. I wouldn't even be able to summarize all those 40 negative aspects of smoking, but smoking is really bad. It has so many negative aspects on everything related to your uh, body and mind, your health, physically, mentally, psychologically. By doing all this, you reinforce and also give foundation, reasoning to that deep wish to quit smoking. And from that moment on, having gathered all that information and being more determined to detach detached from smoking, I then applied step number four. In step number four, you're going to play with your attachment. Normally when you smoke, 
first thing that you do when you open your eyes in the morning, when you wake up, is you light a cigarette. And you have a pattern. You smoke with a cup of coffee, you smoke with a cup of tea, you smoke after a meal, every meal. You have moments that you light up. You smoke a last one before going to bed. So you break the pattern, like we did in step one, with the pattern that we have visiting the past. So I moved my first cigarette from waking up to 10 o'clock coffee. Then some little while later, I moved the first cigarette of the day up from 10 o'clock to lunchtime. Then I moved it up to 4 o'clock tea time. Then I moved it up to after dinner. And I ended up with smoking one cigarette in the evening. And it was not a whole cigarette because we roll tobacco in Holland. So I would fill the paper just with half or even less than half and I would end up with a very small stub, take two or three draws and stub it out. And then one day, just very naturally, without any struggle or pain or... I just, just one day just, just quit. It was done. It was over. The karma was burned up. So it takes time. It took more than a year to quit, but in a very natural way and without violence. Compare that to people who try to quit from one day to another and you will see it's totally different. It usually fails. People, I've tried also, of course, many times before. It doesn't work most of the times. And in this way, you do it very consciously based on information. There is a very clear reason when you have so many negative aspects of whatever it is you're dealing with that the motivation comes naturally. And you start to play. You accept simply being a human being. That's very important. Do not beat yourself up over your weaknesses. It is human. You're just as human as everybody else. But from now on, you start dealing with it consciously. And the the sense of control that you extract from this is so empowering, is so wonderful. <laughs> no? I think... Wait. Can you come forward? Did you come for the introduction workshop? That was yesterday. Yes, but this course has been going on for quite a couple of months already. Saturday, 6 February, we have another workshop. Please try to come then. <laughs> I'm sorry. Have you ever been to Holland? You should go. You walk in the streets early in the morning. You have still these traditional bakery shops. They bake their own bread. The baker and his personnel, they arrive 2, 2 a.m. in the morning and they start baking bread. And the whole street is filled with the smell of fresh bread. <coughs> that is so delicious. <laughs> The smell of the bread is much nicer than the actual bread itself, but freshly baked bread, that is so much nicer than bread that's already cooled down and several hours old. So you go to the bakery shop because you need bread. And of course you're going to go for whole wheat bread or four grain bread. What you come home with is indeed a whole wheat bread sliced and a bunch of pastries and cookies and what have you. Why? Because they put them in front of the bread. And while you are awaiting your turn, you smell the bread, you smell the pastries. Pastries smell even better than bread when they are freshly baked. And it's irresistible. 
Now it's good to enjoy, because enjoyment lifts the spirit, which is what we try to do with yoga in the austere way. But if you overdo it, you kill the spirit. And we know that now. And it's good to enjoy pastry once in a while. When I was a child, we could enjoy a pastry, for example, on birthdays. Christmas, Easter, but that was it. Weekdays, weekends, when there was no special occasion, I could nag my mom for some delicious pastry, she would just outright deny it. It's not your birthday every day, she would say. Just wait until the next occasion. As a child, of course, you have no choice but to follow. But when you get older, you can choose. You have money in your pocket and you go to the bakery shop and it's so easy to lose control. Enjoy it. First and foremost, enjoy it. But when you start to notice that it affects you in a negative way, because, because of the ingredients, the sugar, the white flour, the fat, it drags your energy down, literally. And as a yoga practitioner, one of the greatest benefits of yoga is that you start feeling better and better on a daily basis. And thus, the better you feel, the easier you are affected by negative influence. Like smoking, like drinking, like eating delicious food that is rather heavy. It literally pulls you down, drags you down. Your energy is being dragged down. Because when you feel good, you feel light, it is because your energy is on a high level. Next time when you go to the bakery shop, remembering last time you really enjoyed the pastry, but then you felt really, you felt tired afterwards. You kind of collapsed. Next time you make a shopping list and you resolve, you make a resolution. You say, I have my shopping list. I go to the bakery shop today. I will only buy what is on my list. I will not leave with anything else. And you make it a play. Go to the bakery shop, consciously sniff up the smell, enjoy the smell, the, 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 the view of the delicious pastries, and then remind yourself that it's only for special occasions. Promise yourself to have it on a special occasion, but not today. Today I'm going to stick to my shopping list. If you fail, which will happen once in a while, go home and first and foremost enjoy your pastry. First and foremost, just enjoy it, but do it consciously. Consciously enjoy, but then consciously undergo the repercussions that follow. And that in itself, like with smoking, will naturally motivate you next time to to try harder to stick to your shopping list. Same with Dutch snack bars. Since you've never been there, Dutch snack bars are like no other in the world. Like the bakery shop that the whole street is smelling to those delicious fried, because all, almost everything in the Dutch snack shop is fried. There's so many different croquettes and, and all kinds of Mm. <laughs> and French fries, of course. French fries, the smell of French fries, freshly baked, is irresistible. In the center of Amsterdam, tourists line up to the corner of the block just to buy one little portion of Belgian fries. Same story. French fries, Croquettes, what have you, enjoy them. That's why we invented them properly, probably. But same as with pastries, it's the same story. It's very delicious, very enjoyable, but there are repercussions to that enjoyment because it's rather heavy as most fried foods are. 
So you pay a price for the enjoyment. And again, as yogis, there comes a point that you become conscious of that and you start to resent that every time you collapse in terms of energy and good feeling. So play. If you have a snack shop, a snack bar in your street, you can't avoid having to pass by every time you go home. Pass by. Smell the smell. Look at the people inside enjoying their snacks. And then very consciously determine. Put your foot down and say, I'm going home. You will fail. You come home with a bag of french fries and a croquette. Enjoy it. But again, for example, if you eat snacks in the evening, you wake up and you look like a frog because your face is, is, is swollen and your eyes are bulging and, and you feel like as if you've been mangled. But it was very delicious. Next time you pass by the snack shop, the snack bar, smell the smell, look at the people enjoying it, then promise yourself to have a snack Friday night. Not on Monday, not on Tuesday, Wednesday, no, Friday night. Take control or special occasion. In Korea, that would be chajangmyeon. Children's favorite food is chajangmyeon. The Dutch children's favorite food is French fries with mayonnaise and a croquette. That is what they choose to eat on their birthday. Keep it for special occasions and try to control. But when this is the point, when you don't control, do not end up excoriating yourself, scolding you. Because our own worst enemy, I told you in the first class when we talked about nonviolence, our own word, our first and foremost worst enemy is our inner voice. We are the first to break ourselves down. We are the first to comment negatively about ourselves. And we do that subconsciously. That is the danger. It's a habit that we are not even aware of. So, you remind yourself of the fact you're only human. You enjoy the snack. And then you, you renew your resolve to try to control next time. Okay, step three, we went from two to four because it just happened like that, it connected like that. Step three is a little bit scientific approach where you, if you fail with step two, you try to determine which senses are involved with the attachment. And um, important also is actually the first paragraph of the handout where there is the story of Aesop, Aesop's fable, which is a story about ego. And um, ego is involved in, um, um, in many issues in life where we get hurt or damaged. That is, that is the story of Aesop's fable, in fact. But in daily life, it's not about a piece of uh, bread or cheese. It's especially uh, about uh, relationships. Uh, there are people who are very manipulative, uh, capable of... Um, how do you say that in English? Uh, uh, smearing honey around the lips or something like that? giving you a good feeling with, with lies and, 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 and sto stories, people get, people get scammed like that. Many of, the, many of people who get scammed these days uh, on the internet um, are being lured into a false relationship and then being asked for money. And 
you won't believe how many people actually fall for that and end up going bankrupt, personally bankrupt, because of that. That is Aesop's fable, really. So be aware of how your ego makes you want to believe things that are not realistic. Be realistic. We've learned that in lesson two when we discussed truthfulness. So in that case, be skeptical. A real yogi is in fact skeptical, but in a positive way, in a natural way. Not skeptical for the skepticism, because then you become a, a doubting Thomas. Then you don't believe anything anymore, like you start with the conspiracy theories and what have you, and you are not going to have a vaccine because everybody says you're going to die from it or so. But be skeptical based on realism. Okay, questions? Keep it playful, but be serious about taking control. It is liberating, truly liberating. It will create so much energy, free energy, free space for you to fill in that otherwise would simply go lost because of attachment. The example, the extreme example of the, the, the old people in the, in the bars in, in southern France that experienced the Second World War and were traumatized by it, the, 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 the sad reality of these people is they have not lived since the end of that war. The next 40 years, all they did was getting by, being totally absorbed or drowning in that memory. So that's an extreme example, but we as human beings have a tendency to do just like that. Maybe less extreme, but we have a tendency to do just like that. Do not let that happen. If you have been confronted with traumatic experiences in the past, remind yourself of the fact that if you approach it in the way that we do, it will in fact lead to positive developments that otherwise wouldn't have happened. It becomes your fuel to achieve things that you were otherwise not capable of. But you have to be aware of your thought processes and then you have to be determined to choose to do it in your own way and not drown in the past. That is liberation. Yoga promises liberation. And people make a whole lot about liberation that only few people in the, in the history of mankind uh, will ever uh, reach that. In practical terms, liberation starts here, now, today. And it starts with those things, like memories of the past. Yeah? Questions? Let's have a short break. It's good that you